This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a horror and thriller film called I Spit on Your Grave 3, Vengeance is Mine. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. In Los Angeles, Jennifer Hills, a survivor of a gruesome crime is still haunted by her traumatic experience. She snaps out of her dreams and returns to her therapy session. The therapist suggests joining group therapy sessions with people who have had the same experiences as her. Jennifer is reluctant, but knows that she needs help. Jennifer has abandoned her dreams of becoming a writer. She changed her identity and now goes by the name Angela. She works in an office where her co-worker, Matthew, tries to make small talk. She harshly denies his attempts because she assumes that he only wants to get in her pants. Jennifer can't escape from her past. She continues to have nightmares that leave her feeling heavy. On her daily jog, Jennifer relives the time that she was running through the woods. Suddenly, a group of men intercepted her, and they started harassing her. Jennifer pulled out a gun and shot one of them, but it's only a fantasy, and her anxiousness convinces the men to let her go. During another therapy session, Jennifer shares her recent fantasies. She sees her visions as a representation of justice. Her perception of the world changed after all that she's been through. For her, life is about being a predator or prey, and there's no in between. She believes everyone wants something in return, even if they deny it. While Jennifer waits for the bus, Matthew drives up to her and offers her a ride home. She refuses, pushing Matthew to tell her that not every guy is a jerk. He drives off, and Jennifer sees a flyer for a group sharing session for victims like her. In the group session, Jennifer listens to a woman talking about her views on sexual violations. The session leader, Lynn, introduces Jennifer to the group and encourages her to share. Jennifer refuses, so they take a short break. Oscar approaches Jennifer and they get acquainted. He begins talking about his daughter, and this makes him emotional. Oscar apologizes for crying and leaves. A woman named Marla reveals that Oscar's daughter killed herself when her perpetrator escaped punishment. Marla then invites Jennifer for a smoke. Outside, they talk about Marla's experience with group sharing. She doesn't care for it, but she feels like it helps in some way. Marla bids farewell as she's had enough of hearing sob stories. Later that night, Jennifer encounters the same group of men who cornered her in the park. Marla comes to Jennifer's rescue, insulting the leader's masculinity and leaving him speechless. His friends laugh at Marla's statements and the two walk away smiling. The night brings them to a bar. Marla and Jennifer talk about how men put up acts just to get with a girl. Jennifer shares her experience with Matthew, and Marla makes fun of fake nice guys. Their conversation leads to bashing Lynn and her pacifist views. Marla hates how Lynn pushes forgiveness and healing instead of vengeance. With her past, Jennifer knows all too well that revenge doesn't fix trauma. The next day, Jennifer puts a taser in her bag and leaves for the group session. She and Marla now sit together, and they listen to the story of a young girl named Cassie. Her parents got divorced, and her mother met a new man, Ron. Ron violates Cassie. At the bar, Marla reveals that Cassie still lives with Ron because Cassie's mother doesn't believe her daughter. Marla hates how some women are so obedient to men and disregard every wrong thing they do. In her home, Jennifer notices her broken curtain rod. She goes to a hardware store with Marla to buy a replacement. With all the sharp tools on display, Marla suggests using them to mutilate male genitalia. Jennifer disagrees with her because she believes a sledgehammer is an obvious choice. As the two of them play around, a staff squeezes past them and his hand brushes Jennifer's behind. She turns and bashes his skull in with the sledgehammer. It's just another vision, and Jennifer hits his foot instead. During therapy, Jennifer shares about her new friend. The therapist asks Jennifer if she trusts Marla. She says yes, but still refuses to let go of her pessimistic views. On a different day, the two are on a stakeout outside Cassie's house. They watch Ron hugging Cassie, who's clearly uncomfortable. Marla plans to avenge Cassie. Jennifer observes Ron harassing another woman. Marla has been following him for the past few days, revealing that he's more despicable than she thought. In a parking lot, a masked Marla sneaks up behind Ron and attacks him with a crowbar. Ron gives her his wallet, but Marla isn't finished. She threatens Ron and makes him promise to stop harassing women. After a few more hits, she and Jennifer leave him beaten and bloody. In the next group session, Cassie shares that Ron suddenly became nice to her. Marla then begins advocating violence, but Lynn disapproves of it. After the meeting, Marla is in a hurry to leave. Jennifer asks what's wrong, and Marla tells her that her ex reached out to her to ask for his belongings. She has a restraining order against him, hence her anxiety about their complicated situation. Marla promises to meet Jennifer at their usual bar, and leaves. The next day at work, Matthew invites Jennifer to have a drink with some of their co-workers. Jennifer apologizes for her rudeness before, but still 
refuses. Since she has to meet with Marla, Jennifer tells Matthew to invite her again another time. This brings a smile to his face. At the bar, Jennifer drinks alone. The night passed and Marla never arrived. In the group session, everyone seems gloomy. Lynn suddenly comforts Jennifer. Jennifer is clueless and Lynn breaks the news of Marla's death. Jennifer is in disbelief and she starts shouting at Lynn. Lynn promotes the acceptance of Marla's death and urges Jennifer to start her mourning process. Jennifer lashes out and she punches and chokes Lynn. Fortunately, it's just another fantasy. The detective on Marla's case, McDillon, arrives. He reveals that Marla's case is a homicide. Oscar becomes aggressive, asking whether or not Marla was violated. Lynn tries to calm Oscar down, but he gets more furious. The way the police handled his daughter's case made Oscar resent them. He then walks out. McDillon asks the group if they have any idea of what could have happened to Marla. No one speaks up, so McDillon waits by the food table for privacy, where Jennifer approaches him. She asks for the details of Marla's case. McDillon shares that Marla was murdered. Jennifer suspects that Marla's ex killed her. McDillon then invites her for a cup of coffee, and she accepts. Jennifer tells McDillon that Marla's death doesn't make sense. Marla seemed to be strong, but McDillon thinks it was all a facade to hide that Marla's similar to the women that she hates. They end the meeting because McDillon can't share any more details. He then promises to bring Marla's ex to justice. On her way home, the same group of men harass Jennifer. The men see that Marla isn't with Jennifer, so they start insulting Marla. This prompts another vision where she kills them and stabs the man's eye. She leaves, burying her morbid fantasies once again. In her office cubicle, Jennifer reads a news article about Marla's murder, Nicholas. Marla's ex-boyfriend was recently released from police custody. She hurries to leave but bumps into Matthew. Jennifer returns to her rude self and shouts at him. Outside the police station, Jennifer confronts McDillon. She knows Nicholas killed Marla, and McDillon agrees with her. However, there isn't enough evidence to prove that. Jennifer leaves disappointed. In her home, Jennifer lashes out by smashing plates and throwing a knife at a painting. She pulls it out and throws it again. With a belt, Jennifer measures her thigh. She cuts the belt, attaches the knife, and wears the contraption. Her past murders play in her head as she prepares to commit another. At a bar, Jennifer stares at Nicholas seductively. She leaves the establishment, and he follows close behind. In a dark alleyway, Nicholas flirts with Jennifer and begins kissing her. Jennifer then insults Nicholas and his male organ. This angers Nicholas, so he strikes Jennifer repeatedly. He then tries to force feed Jennifer his meat. She then remembers a similar situation from her past. While the tip is in her mouth, Jennifer stabs the shaft. She bites off the head, splits the shaft, and blood gushes out. After a few more stabs, Jennifer spits out the tip. Nicholas crawls and screams in pain, and Jennifer gives the final blow with the crowbar. She smashes him again for good measure, and this time, what happened isn't just a fantasy. In a therapy session, Jennifer expresses her anger and how humans find pleasure in cruelty. Despite this, she's also aware of her sadistic tendencies. During a group session, Cassie shares that Ron is back to his old and disgusting ways. Oscar is furious. He says that someone needs to stop Ron once and for all. Oscar thinks that Ron should be violated with a metal pipe. This prompts Lynn to pull Oscar outside. With a determined and sinister look on her face, Jennifer goes back to the hardware store. Later that night, Jennifer wearing a school uniform approaches Ron. She asks Ron for directions, and he insists on accompanying her. They arrive in a shady-looking area. Ron wants to go inside with her. Jennifer accepts, and as soon as they're inside, she invites Ron to play by calling Ron Daddy. Ron gets excited. She positions herself on a mattress, and Ron quickly pulls down his pants. But then, Ron gets tasered and falls to the ground screaming. After a while, Ron regains consciousness. He's all tied up and Jennifer sneaks up to him. She grabs a metal pipe, and this frightens Ron. Jennifer forces Ron to repeat the acts that he made Cassie do. He kisses the pipe's tip, and Jennifer is amused. She hits him with the pipe and shoves his chair. With his exposed behind, Ron starts begging and apologizing. Jennifer isn't too much of a monster because she lubes up the metal pipe first. She pushes it in, slowly, and Ron screeches in pain. Then with the sledgehammer, Jennifer smashes the pipe deeper. Jennifer stops because Ron isn't alive to satisfy her with his screams. On a different day, Jennifer's therapist asks her if she feels remorse for what she did. Jennifer doesn't see the value in feeling guilty or asking for forgiveness. Revenge has become the only basis for her actions. The police join the group before the session begins. Detective Boyle introduces herself and her team. Oscar scoffs at Boyle, which she notices. She asks Oscar about a threat he said during the last session. 
Boyle knows Oscar suggested ramming Ron's back door with the pipe. McDillon then informs the group that Ron is dead. He tries a calm and caring approach, but Oscar remains stubborn, so Boyle arrests him. She then commands McDillon to detain the rest. At work, Matthew sits beside Jennifer who's zoning out. He asks if she wants to talk, but Jennifer turns him down again. Later that day, Jennifer meets up with Oscar who's been released. She wants to talk about his daughter's case. His daughter's perpetrator had money and power. He bribed the police and made Oscar's daughter seem like a trollop. Oscar asks Jennifer what made her suddenly interested in his daughter's story. So, Jennifer shares that one of the men who violated her was a cop. Oscar reveals where the offender currently works at. He regrets not getting revenge, even if it meant imprisonment. On another day, the offender just got out of a gym that he works in. He's Jennifer's newest prey, and she follows him closely behind. Finally, they reach a secluded area. With the taser in hand, Jennifer rushes at him, but he turns to face her. Jennifer tries to attack, but misses. He then strikes her and chokes her. With a knife, Jennifer stabs his neck. The man is unaffected, pinning Jennifer to the wall and throwing her into a trash can. She tries to fight back, but gets knocked out. He rips her clothes off, and while he's busy pulling down her jeans, Jennifer reaches the taser and electrocutes him. She tries crawling away, but he returns the favor and electrocutes her. Luckily, McDillon and his partner arrive. He orders the man to get on the ground, but he refuses, forcing McDillon to shower him with bullets. At the police station, Boyle interrogates a battered Jennifer. She asks Jennifer questions quickly in an attempt to catch her slipping. However, Jennifer handled the questions with ease. Boyle then asks Jennifer about the picture of a girl on a pendant that she was wearing. Chastity Storch was her name, the daughter of the police officer Jennifer killed in her past. Boyle connects the dots, deducing Jennifer's true identity. Boyle gets to the point, piecing all of the information that proves Jennifer is the one behind the murders. Boyle stops questioning, as she's sure that Jennifer is guilty. Out of nowhere, Oscar arrives at the station with slashed and bloody forearms. Before he dies of blood loss, Oscar confesses to the murders. During a therapy session, the therapist asks Jennifer where her bruises came from. Jennifer then rants about how justice can only be achieved by the one who wants it. The police shouldn't be relied on, and anyone else for that matter. The therapist adds that Jennifer may have gotten justice, but not peace. However, Jennifer announces that she isn't finished. When Jennifer comes home, she immediately destroys her belongings out of anger. She calms down and goes out wearing a sexy red dress. Jennifer walks down the streets with the same determined and sinister look. As Matthew leaves work, he sees Jennifer standing like a deer caught in headlights. Matthew notices that she isn't well and offers her a ride home. Jennifer assumes that the ride he's offering is a euphemism. She tells him to drop his nice guy act because she knows Matthew just wants to get with her. Matthew denies it and Jennifer pulls out a knife. She rushes at Matthew and he leaves immediately. Later that night, McDillon sees Jennifer and follows her. Jennifer gets approached by the man from before, and as he nears, Jennifer hides her knife. His playful manner quickly changes when Jennifer acts all crazy. Jennifer then kneels and opens her mouth. The man considers accepting her offer. Then, Jennifer attempts to slash him but misses. The man punches her, and in the distance is McDillon. He distracts the man, allowing Jennifer to disable him. She threatens to slit the man's throat. As McDillon reaches for his gun, Jennifer raises her knife. Just before the blade connects, McDillon fires. The day of Jennifer's last therapy session arrives. It's been two years since she was in prison for attempted murder. The therapist advises her to stay out of trouble and to find a new sharing group. Jennifer agrees to drop her unlikable attitude and be nice for once. Jennifer exits and leaves a distasteful farewell gift for her therapist. As she walks along the corridor, fellow inmates attempt to shiver. She overpowers them and stabs one repeatedly. The other rushes at her and Jennifer slits her throat. Unfortunately for the therapist, she exits the room and also gets stabbed. But Jennifer snaps out of another morbid fantasy. This is all for story recap for today. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Tell us in the comments if you want us to recap your favorite movie. Watch other of our videos showing on the screen and leave a like because it helps the channel, and I would see you in the next video, goodbye.